Um, it's truly an honor to be here. I want to thank you for the invitation. Uh, for the invitation to, to come visit. Um, and I did spend some time as an undergraduate in Rome, so it was wonderful to see pictures. Um, I minored in Italian law. I majored in biochemistry, so sort of always interested in art and science. Um, and today, what I want to do is tell you a little bit about what my lab works on, which is trying to understand the biological basis by which our bodies measure time and use that to control biology, right? Use it to control our behavior and physiology. Um, and so, I want to start off by just highlighting the breadth of biological timing that exists on Earth. Um, and perhaps many of you understand that intrinsically within your bodies, we have mechanisms that keep track of time and use that to coordinate and organize and synchronize our biology. Um, we often think of circadian rhythms, that is to say, timing that occurs on a, uh, sort of a time scale of about a day, um, as being useful. Let's see if this is laser. Um, oh, that's quite a pointer. Um, in basically helping us coordinate our timeline with that of the terrestrial Earth. Right, that as the Earth rotates about its axis once per day, biology has developed clocks in order to, to use this information. So I'm highlighting a series of organisms here, from cyanobacteria shown in the middle, all the way up to these beautiful sunflowers, each of which, of course, has an intimate relationship with light as photosynthetic organisms. So they evolved clocks to anticipate when the next round of sunlight would come. So I'm going to show you a movie um, that sort of highlights, I think, the power of circadian rhythms. Here what we're doing is looking at a baby sunflower, so it doesn't have these beautiful um, flowers here on the edge. What it's doing is tracking the sunlight or food throughout the day. And as we get towards the end of the day, um, I'm going to use this term very loosely. The plant is going to sleep. It's not really sleep, right? But it's going to a dormant state. And here's where you see the power of circadian rhythms, that because the organism knows that a day is 24 hours, it can wake up and point towards east so that it's ready for those first delicious rays of sun that come in the morning so it can utilize that energy and make up for a night in the dark. Right? So we think of circadian rhythms as providing the power to anticipate the coming of the next day. Right? Having time within allows us to then coordinate our efforts. And it's not just photosynthetic organisms that do this, but all the way up from those tiny single cell cyanobacteria up into animals, invertebrates, and even humans. Right? So all of these forms of life manage within themselves to coordinate their function on a 24-hour rhythm. Right? And so I'm going to show you a horrible diagram, or amazing, depending on how you think about it. Um, if any of you are taking biochemistry or medical school, this biological subway diagram is basically a picture of the sort of network of metabolism within your body. Each one of these little circles is an enzyme that does something more important to the food and nutrients that you take to pass it down this chain in your body so that we can live. Arguably a very complicated diagram. And so just to give you a feeling for the extent to which the clock controls your physiology, I'm going to highlight in red each of the enzymes that are under circadian control in your body. So basically your metabolism is a clock. It works on a time scale such that the time that you eat impacts what happens to the food that you consume, where it goes, and how your metabolism functions. Right. So there's been a lot of groundbreaking genetics. In fact, last year, um, three people in my field were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their work in elucidating the genetic basis of the network and how circadian time happens. I'm not going to go through this diagram because it's almost as complicated as that metabolic diagram I showed you. Uh, but suffice to say that we understand at a cartoon level how circadian timing arises at a, within your cells. I'm going to simplify this for the rest of the talk so that we can focus on what I would call the core clock proteins. And as a biochemist, um, I'm representing a, a gene product, a protein, um, with a little circle here. So each one of these genes that have these very interesting names like period or per uh, corresponds to a protein that's encoded by a, a gene or a chromosome. So what happens is that clock and female, shown here in green and blue, sit down on DNA, and they drive the expression of these genes. So if we're monitoring one of these, which I'm just going to highlight period two here, we can watch as the levels of transcription, or the levels of the gene come up, sorry, here. Um, and as the levels of this uh, gene come up, the whole idea of this network is that as you accumulate period two, it shuts down activity. So what happens as a consequence is that the level goes down, and then when there's not enough of the brake pedal, the levels come back up again, and it goes down, up, and down. So you see that what you generate is this beautiful sinusoidal oscillation of gene expression that goes up, 
and down. And it does this one time per day, such that by the time you go from one peak to the next, a full 24 hours has passed. This is the molecular basis of the clock within your body. But what's remarkable to me is it doesn't just happen with these genes here that make up the clock, but in fact, nearly 10,000 genes in your body do this every single day, that they're being made at specific times of day to control when a particular biological process happens. So we'll touch on melatonin later, but I assume here, everyone here has heard of melatonin and or taken melatonin, right? This is a hormone that is controlled by the clock. It starts to peak um, in the presence of dim light in the evening, and it helps prepare you for sleep, right? So this is a gene that is under circadian control. So in my lab, we're biochemists. We want to understand how is it that this little process, this feedback loop, as I'm describing it here, why does this take 24 hours, right? Why does, what happens when there are mutations that we inherit that cause it to change? So fundamentally, because this happens within a cell, um, one of the large breakthroughs of our field was to identify that actually this process is not something that takes a whole brain. <laughs> it doesn't take it that person. It takes just a single cell to keep time. So what I'm showing you here is a movie. Each one of these little specks that you see is an individual cell that's plated out on a dish. And rather than look at the expression of a particular gene, what we've done is steal the gene from fireflies, right? this gene reciprocates that glows. So we can watch as this gene that glows is being made and degraded, made and degraded. And down below here, you can see uh, we're tracing the light signal that's coming from that little teeny cell in the middle of that image that's boxed in yellow. And hopefully, okay, the picture's not quite as pretty as my cartoon, but it goes up and down, and it happens once per day. Right? We're looking at 40 to 50 photons per minute that are being emitted right, from, from this single cell. So this told us that fundamentally, circadian timing happens within our cells. So just like Carl Sagan had his billions of stars, we have billions of clocks in our body, right? So they happen at the cellular level. And what's most beautiful is that within a particular tissue, they get coordinated together to work to sort of confer the ability of that tissue to tell time. So this is an image of what we call the master clock in the brain, in the hypothalamus. And hopefully, um, each of these little um, nodes that you can see has around 10,000 neurons. And I think this is just mesmerizing as you watch the levels of luciferase come up and down right, each, each day. Right? And so this ultimately is how, how the clock works. Now, about 20 years ago, Chuck Seisler at Harvard measured human circadian behavior and found that across, across a wide range of people, circadian timing was quite robust. Right? Circadian meaning about a day, that it happens 24 hours, 11 minutes, plus or minus 5 minutes in the human population. So I really want you to think of these circles, or these proteins here, as molecular cogs in a clock, right? And it, ultimately, just as we can look at an old mechanical clock and how it would, the pieces would interlock to give rise to timing, we now know that, of course, proteins aren't circles <laughs> that just flop onto one another, but they have discrete interactions that help them uh, execute this program of circadian timing. This is what we focus on as biochemists. So I thought I would have a little fun and walk you through um, our goal to use changes in human circadian timing to understand better the molecular basis of timing. So we know um, from many studies that if, as a, a human, if your circadian timing runs shorter than this sort of average of about 24 hours, that you tend to be a morning lark. That is to say you tend to go to bed early and you like to rise early, right? And this traces its roots back to melatonin, in fact. Because if your clock is shorter than a day, melatonin starts peaking and coming up in your body a bit before you might like. And you tend to be sleepier earlier in the evening. Um, you get your nice rest of eight hours. Hopefully you're all getting eight hours of sleep. You know, the culture of Silicon Valley is not to sleep, but you should, uh, right? And so because you go to bed early, you rise early. Likewise, we know that if your clock tends to run longer than 24 hours, that predisposes you to be a so-called night owl, right? Again, we trace the roots of this to the fact that melatonin doesn't start to come up until much later than we would like. So as try as you might to go to bed, you're just going to toss and turn, right? Okay. So there is a sort of self-assessment questionnaire you can take known as the Munich Chronotype Questionnaire, made by Till Romenberg where you can answer a series of, I think, 10 or 15 questions about your sort of sleep preference and when you like to go to bed on days that you work and when you like to go to bed on the weekend when you're free, right? So maybe work during Monday through Friday. 
And what we're showing here is a histogram of sort of the percent of population in their preference. And most of us have these clocks that are around 24 hours long. That would be the green and cyan bars, such that we like to go to bed around midnight, and we like to wake up around 8 on a free day, right? So I would encourage you. I think he's actually switching web servers right now, so you may not be able to access this, but you can bookmark it and go back if you're interested. I did this questionnaire several years ago, and I find myself to be a moderate early type, which means that I, right around 10.30, I like to hit the hay, but I'm one of the lucky 20% of the double population that wakes up happily in the morning without an alarm clock. So I'd like to get a show of hands. Who here can wake up in the morning without an alarm clock, happily get up and go about your day? Right? So, ooh, I see maybe a little more than 20%. <laughs> Um, but, but this is you know, basically rooted in the timing that your body keeps within it, right? So our understanding of the basis for morning lark behavior actually started ironically enough with this little guy. So this is a Syrian hamster. Uh, and it turned out that we can trace our understanding really to the molecular sort of origins of timing to this one. So you know, many years ago, uh, Michael Menneker, who's pictured here, was studying using this organism to study sort of the molecular basis by which the clock controls behavior. And he did so by watching a Syrian hamster in his cage, and we see the wheel there. And we know that hamsters, if any of you have them for pets, they like to run, right? So they run when they're awake, and they don't run when they're asleep. <laughs> so you could basically monitor when the wheel was moving around and as a sort of easy measure for their activity. The reason that Mike was studying Syrian hamsters is they have a really beautiful, almost perfectly 24-hour period. So what I'm showing you here on the right, everywhere there's a thick blue bar, that's indicating that the Syrian hamster is running in the wheel. And you can see that if we line up their activity profile on a 24-hour terrestrial day, they wake up with like military precision, right? They wake up and start running if you line them up because their clock is almost exactly 24 hours, right? So they were using this organism to just understand how it is that the clocks take place. But Martin Ralph, one of the graduate students, noticed that one hamster, literally one, right? This, this was not a genetic screen. This was a random observation that one hamster liked to wake up way before his litter mates, way before his brothers and sisters. And so if you plot that animal, I'll just see if I can get you a pointer here, right? If this is how he be begins one day, the next day he starts four hours earlier. Hopefully you can see that by the way the sort of it the offset of uh, the behavior. So it's such that when we plot it on a 24-hour day, it just looks crazy, right? So they thought this was interesting. They bred that that Syrian hamster. They found out that that trait was heritable, right? And through you know much much more work, they found that in fact it was our first circadian mutant in a mammalian species. So if I go back to this cartoon model, it turned out that it took about another 10 years or so for my postdoctoral advisor, Joe Takahashi, to map where that mutation was that caused this. And it mapped to one of the core clock proteins known as casein kinase 1 delta, and they call CK1 for short here. So I'm indicating that with a little star over there, and this mouse was given a clever name for tau because it had a change in the timing of the clock, right? So we had some idea that this mutant was important. Um, and since then, so since maybe sort of early 2000, there have been a number of other studies based on human genetics that have ident identified changes in casein kinase 1, or CK1, and what we now know to be its target protein, known as period, cleverly named because it was first identified in the 70s as being a gene that when mutated could change the length of the clock. Right? So this was the sort of underlying um, basis by which the three gentlemen were recently awarded the Nobel Prize for identifying the basis of this gene and, and how it worked. So to us, as biochemists, if we want to go at a higher resolution beyond circles to understanding how timing works, we have a laser, pun intended, pointing at these two genes, telling us that somehow encoding of time happens by the way these two proteins interact with one another and regulate one another's activity. So that's what I'm going to take the rest of my time telling you about. So I'm going to delve into another type of a protein cartoon. <laughs> So here I'm representing the per protein kind of as a wet spaghetti noodle because it turns out it's a very flexible dynamic protein. Um, and I'm now just still representing the kinase as this blue circle. So it turns out that CK1, jump the gun a little bit, is a type of an enzyme. And what it, what it likes to do is add 
circles are a little off, add a little chemical group or a modification. In other words, it can mark a protein. And so here, CK1 will mark the pureed protein, and in doing so, it creates a binding site for a protein that I've, I've depicted as a Pac-Man, who comes along and basically chew, helps to chew pureed up and get rid of it, such that when CK1 targets the site I've shown, you have less HER2 in the cell. Right? You're with me? Okay. Um, just this last year, we published a paper with David Beership at the Duke and U.S. Medical School in Singapore showing that CK1 actually has a completely new role as well. That in fact, it also targets a site that's much distant in the protein, as it evidenced by a little break in the protein there. And in fact, uh, the way that we identified that was by taking an image, if you will, of our protein. So you've probably heard of magnetic resonance imaging, right? So that takes advantage of a quantum property within the nucleus of, the, of certain atoms that we use and that we have within us. Well, we can do the same thing, but we can use that, in essence, to image a protein. So this is called NMR spectroscopy, spectroscopy or nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. <coughs> and basically, all you need to know from the nuts and bolts of this is that every single one of these little circles that we see here is telling us about one amino acid of the protein. So it allows us to do biochemistry with really unprecedented resolution to understand how the pieces of the protein work together. So here is just a, a zoom-in region of, of part of the per protein. And if we then add this CK1 into our experiment, we can see that we get a new peak here that I've sort of highlighted in this kind of fuzzy red color. It corresponds to that first phosphate, the first P that gets added over there. And working in sort of very diligently, we were able to show that, in fact, once the first one gets marked, it leads to the second one, which leads to the third, and so forth and so on. And in fact, this kinase has to hopscotch through all of these individual sites in order to mark this protein. And the end result of this is that it stabilizes or increases the level of per protein in your cell. And the mechanism by which that happens, we are still working on in my lab. So we now have what's called a, a sort of a switch that depending on which sites the protein marks, we either get rid of period protein or we can keep more of it around. And what's really striking is that this correlates very nicely with the length of the clock. But if you want to take a circadian rhythm and make it a bit shorter, you can get rid of the perju. If you want to make it longer, you can keep it around. Right. So I want to introduce a human mutation or two just to sort of give you some context for why we got into this. And so uh, this paper came out in 2001. It was my first year as a PhD student, sort of naive in thinking that we would figure out the molecular basis of, of circadian timing. Um, and Louis Tachek's lab, um, at, first at the University of Utah, and now he's at UCSF, identified a, a mutation or a variation in the genome that gets rid of the first amino acid needed for that stabilizing phosphorylation. So that's illustrated by the red X, right? And I told you that our protein, CK1, has to hop along all of those little steps. And if we get rid of the first step, nothing else downstream can happen. And in fact, we showed that last year in our paper. So the idea here is that if we can't move that needle of the switch to the right, the kinase will target those sites to the left. We'll recruit our protein that will degrade the, the period enzyme, and it leads us to a shorter clock, right? So in humans, having a short clock, so the sort of phenomenon Phenomenological name for this is the familial advanced sleep phase syndrome. It's a mouthful, otherwise known as FASPS by its acronym. And this is characterized by people that like to go to bed early. They have an advanced sleep uh, phase of when their sleep is. So this is a, a nice old picture of a gentleman who, despite the clear presence of sun, uh, is getting sleepy and ready to go to bed, you know, at 7:30 or so. Uh, one consequence, as I mentioned before, of going to bed early is however, that you like to wake up with the sun or before the sun. So many people who have um, FASPS often aren't even diagnosed because they like the fact that they are productive and awake in the morning. And in fact, studies, uh, there's some landmark studies from Denmark that have shown that children who tend to have earlier chronotypes do better in school because school schedules are aligned in the morning and people are awake and active and their cognitive performance is enhanced in the morning. Right? So this often isn't viewed as a liability. What I really love, though, is that this mutation was first identified, um, what led to this science paper about 20 years ago, because a grandmother who had spent her whole life going to bed early and waking up before anyone else, right, at four in the morning, she noticed that her young granddaughter was doing the same thing. And it really struck her for the first time that this is heritable, 
Okay, I have something in me <laughs> that got passed on, and she took her daughter to the University of Utah Human Genetics Clinic where they donated samples that led to this, and really broke up, and I think, our field and our understanding of circadian rhythms. Right? So we understand that there are mutations or changes in your genome that you can inherit that will change the intrinsic timing and affect your sleep. What about the tau protein? Right? And so um, I told you that uh, after about a decade of study, Joe Takahashi identified the very single amino acid change that occurred within that enzyme that gave rise to this short period. So again, I'm just depicting that as a little star um, on the blue seeking uh, sort of representation above. So the question was, how does this give rise to a short period? Uh, and I would say that's not really known yet. <laughs> We're still working that on that in my lab. Um, evidence uh, that we have that's unpublished suggests that CK1, this mutation, supercharges it to go after that site that turns over per protein. It basically helps this kinase get rid of period, right? So even though both sites and period are available, it, this kinase now, this mutant kinase, if you will, prefers to get rid of PER. And in doing so, that recruits the protein that degrades, we end up with less PER, right? So the way as biochemists that we try to rationalize this and understand why does changing one amino acid change the function of this kinase is to lead us to structural biology, to a point where we can actually image and visualize the shape of this particular protein and understand how it works. So this is a sort of a cartoon representation of what a protein looks like. And in fact, it's the structure of casein kinase 1, um, shown here in blue. And shown here in red are um, chemical groups that mimic that phosphate, the P that I've shown. And in every structure of CK1, it likes to nestle two of them into very specific places. In my lab now, we're just working to understand what they do and how they work. So I had a student uh, that set out to understand this tau protein. So he decided he would try and crystallize this and, and solve the structure of the tau mute to see if there was a change in the shape or dynamics of the protein to explain its altered behavior. So it was exciting to us. We were uh, anticipating that this mutation, which is located right behind this uh, negative charge here, that it might change this balance of the binding phosphates. So, I'll show you a movie in a minute, but I'll fade into the structure. It kind of looks the same, right? <laughs> when I show you this picture, you're trying to understand the tau kinase. Um, it wasn't very clear, other than the most obvious difference is that we're no longer binding those two phosphates, the two negative charges shown there. So I'll show you a movie that is going to morph between the two conformations, the two shapes, if you will. And so two things I want to draw your attention to. First. There's a whole lot of the protein where nothing is changing, right? This is distant from where the mutation is, the sort of the architecture, if you will, the foundation of this protein. The mutation is located here, but if you look, largely the protein looks the same, the shape is the same. But what you can see is that uh, this loop, I didn't show the side chains of the amino acids, but this loop uh, is actually makes an important interaction with this negative charge. And it tends to change between blue is the normal protein, mm -hmm. which is the mutant. But there's a change coupled here and here, right? We're talking movements of angstroms, you know, millions of a meter, right? This little protein is wiggling back and forth. And in doing so, flipping this molecular switch, if you will, is what is responsible for changing how this kinase targets one site or another to make you an early or late person. So we're beginning now to, to dig deep into this. This is unpublished work I'm showing. Uh, but what was very exciting to us, right, is that in addition to this tau mutant, which is located in this pocket, there are three other mutations that are inherited by people that give rise to short clocks. And they all live up here where I've just kind of illustrated with stars. And hopefully you can see that this is the other region that is wiggling and waggling back and forth. Right? So we now have a molecular fingerprint for two regions of this kinase that are going back and forth to control where it likes to target the prey protein for degradation. Right? So this sort of elaborate contraption, if you will, this Rube Goldberg machine of, of biology and this timekeeper is called a phospho switch. In other words, how the protein decides to target two different sites to control the length of the clock. Um, I'm going to geek out on you a little bit, um, and hopefully this joke, I shouldn't practice it because then no one will laugh. But, uh, <laughs> Um, so has anybody seen uh, 
Frank Herbert's Dune, or read, read the book, or seen his, see, this is a picture from David Lynch's movie of it. If you have, then you'll know this reference that he who controls the spice controls the universe, right? This is from the movie where they're mining this sort of amazing substance that allows people to transmute space and time, right? So what I hope to get across to you is that on a protein level, he who controls per two controls timing of the clock, right? But if we can make it stick around or we can make it degrade faster, we can compress or extend the timing of our circadian rhythm, which highlights obvious pharmacological approaches to control timing of the clock. Right? Okay, so I'll just finish up um, by drawing your attention back to this sort of diagram where we have circles and they do things, right? <laughs> but as biochemists, this is a very unsatisfying diagram because it doesn't explain to us how the proteins work together. So I've highlighted now several mutations on the kinase and on PER2 that drive that clock from its sort of normal 24-hour rhythm to an early late period, or sorry, an early chronotype. Um, likewise, there's an additional mutation on PER2 in this region that, that we think flips the switch the other way and drives people to have a late night uh, phenotype or late night behavior. In addition, we have two projects in my lab. Um, that are looking at mutations on other clock genes that also predispose you to a late night behavior. So one of these was published last year by Michael Young, one of the gentlemen who was awarded the Nobel Prize, and he identified an incredibly prevalent variant in the CRI1 gene. So one out of every 70 people of European descent. So I don't know that we're quite at 70 here, but there's almost certainly someone here in this room who predisposes, you know, sort of their behavior towards NIDAL, but we can trace a loss of a few amino acids, right? So in my lab, we've been trying to study how this works and affects behavior. So it sounds kind of cute to talk about, you know, are you a morning lark, or are you a night owl? But I just want to finish by emphasizing that circadian rhythms do not just control when you like to go to sleep, but in fact, all of your physiology and behavior, right? So the sleep-wake cycle is just one of the behavioral aspects that is under circadian control. Your appetite, obviously, is under control, um, and your cognitive performance. Yes, you are actually smarter at one time of day, for record, for those of you who have math tests to take, that's between 10 a.m. and noon, <laughs> right? So the clock primes us to have higher cognitive performance at particular times of day. And essentially, any physiological characteristic you can think of is under circadian control, from the way that your, food, your body metabolizes nutrients to producing hormones, your cardiovascular function, your response to immune challenge, cell division, et cetera, et cetera, right? All of this is gated or timed so that things happen at a specific time of day. So I have this picture up here because I think what's amazing about circadian rhythms is that it really truly links our cellular phenomena, the, the processes of our body, to something really beyond Earth itself, right? Something <laughs> universal. The rotation of Earth without its axis, the life evolved on Earth, so did our biology evolve an intimate link to that. So much to Elon Musk's consternation, if we want to pick up and move to Mars, which has a 25-hour day, we can better find the night owls out in the audience that have those long clocks so they can you know, resonate um, in sort of in ticking time with, with their new planet. Okay, so I just want to really briefly thank just two people. So this is a uh, number of people who are in my lab currently, as well as collaborators. So Sabrina Hunt and John Philpott, um, are doing some of the work I talked to you about. Um, and Carlo Perico, shown down here, is working on this sort of night owl project that uh, I told you about. I want to thank uh, David Yershev and Rajesh Narsimovrithi, who did some of this work with us. Uh, and then also Louis Patacek, who identified this first human variant, as well as his colleague, uh, Ni Wei Fu. They're really eminent human geneticists who are helping us understand how human time, circadian timing, can impact biochemistry. Um, and with that, I will thank you for your attention.